You are a manager, a parent, a business leader or a head of state and you have a problem, a big problem, and you just don't know where to start from to solve it. People you talk to might say, don't worry, things have to get worse before they get better, or things will fix themselves, or more profoundly, this too shall pass. These are not really constructive solutions, but there is a scientific element in them. Sean Carroll is a theoretical physicist and a research professor at the California Institute of Technology. He is also the author of several bestseller books about the universe. In this presentation, he tells us how the universe and thinking like a physicist can help individuals to find the solution to complex issues by looking at the big picture. And he gives us some examples. Take a listen. In many contexts, it is useful, even if you're not doing physics, to think like a physicist, to think beyond the specific system that you're looking at, and to instead contemplate general principles that apply to all sorts of systems. And I'm going to start with two ideas that seem to be in competition a little bit, and showing how resolving those ideas, thinking like a physicist, can help us understand them better. So idea number one is the universe, or any closed system inside the universe, moves from order to disorder. This is the famous second law of thermodynamics. Entropy increases in isolated systems. Entropy is a way of talking about the randomness, the disorderliness, the disorganization of different things, and it tends to grow with time. So the classic example is cream and coffee. Imagine that you have delicately put cream on top of your coffee cup. Coffee is underneath. That is a low entropy situation. Everything is very orderly. All the creams on the top, all the coffees on the bottom. Now imagine mixing them together, easy enough to do, you get a high entropy situation where everything is mixed up. That is a disorderly situation, you don't know which molecule is cream, which molecule is coffee. But there's another fact that I want to point out, which is that the universe is full of extremely complex systems. Systems that are interconnected in many intricate ways, things that seem at first glance to be extremely orderly. You can think of living beings, living organisms, or the ecosystem in which they're embedded. You can think of political or social or economic systems. And of course, you can think about technology. You can think about the internet. Here's a picture of a little part of the internet. Or you can think about individual computers within the internet. So here's the question. If the universe is full of these extremely complex systems, but all it does is move from order to disorder, the whole history of the universe in some sense is a winding down, a becoming more messy and chaotic. How in the world is it that these complex systems come to be? How do we get the spontaneous generation of complexity and interconnectedness that we see in nature? Turns out, this is a hard question, we don't know fully the answer to it, but it's under investigation, and by thinking about it, we can learn some general features of complex systems. Here is one very, very important feature, namely that the difference between simple and complex is very different than the difference between orderly and disorderly. Think about that cup of coffee again. When we start, it's orderly, all the cream on top, all the coffee on the bottom, low entropy. When we end, it's high entropy, everything's mixed up, very disorderly. But when we begin, it's very simple. Cream's on the top, coffee's on the bottom. Complexity is a way of talking about how much information you need to give me to describe a system. If all I need to do is say cream on the top, coffee on the bottom, that's a very small amount of information. That is a simple system. But then at the end, when it's high entropy, it's also simple. Everything is mixed together. That's all you need to tell me. It's in between. It's when the mixing is happening, when the intricate tendrils of cream and coffee are mixing together in fractal patterns. That's when it looks complex. And this is a fundamental insight about the nature of complexity. Complex doesn't mean orderly. Complexity comes into existence, or can come into existence, on the road from order to disorder. This is something that is not only true for cups of coffee, it's a wide phenomenon. Think about the universe as a whole. 14 billion years ago, near the Big Bang, the universe was very low entropy, and it was very simple. It was very organized. It was hot, dense, smooth, rapidly expanding. 
In the far, far future, the universe will be high entropy. Space will empty out, stars will die, everything will be scattered to the four winds. But it will once again be simple. It will be very easy to describe it. There's nothing there but empty space. It's in between. It's now that the universe is exciting, interesting, complex, filled with all these different kinds of things going on. So this seems to be kind of a general phenomenon. We have a rule that says that things go from orderly low entropy to disorderly high entropy, but complexity first rises out of simplicity and then goes away. Or at least I gave you two examples where that's true. So we can ask, is this a fundamental principle? We don't know, but the answer seems to be it depends. It depends on other details of the system that we haven't specified yet. So some friends of mine and I actually looked at this by simulating cream mixing into coffee in a computer simulation. And we had to choose what we meant by mixing. How did the actual mixing happen? If you just let individual molecules of cream and coffee pass by each other, complex structures never arise. But if you do something more intricate, a little bit more complicated, where there can be small scale motions, but also large scale coherent motions, then you see the complexity arise. Then you can see these two plots, one with little tiny local interactions. You go from low entropy to high entropy without complexity ever arising. But with these multi-scale interactions, complexity comes before it eventually fades away. So the important lesson here is that entropy is not your enemy, really. We are all complex systems that are embedded in an environment where entropy is increasing, and that's actually important to us. Entropy seems like your enemy because it takes things apart, right? Things fall into disrepair. But the fact that we can repair things also depends on the fact that entropy is increasing. Complex systems like ourselves both come into existence and then also maintain our complexity, our integrity, our working parts in good alignment with each other by increasing the entropy of the universe. Think about living beings. Think about the biosphere here on Earth, right? We say to ourselves, we need the energy we get from solar radiation, okay? We use the light from the sun, plants photosynthesize, human beings eat the plants, etc. But think about that a little more carefully. The Earth actually radiates into space almost exactly the same amount of energy as it gets from the sun. There's no net input of energy to keep life on Earth going. What's happening is what we get from the sun is visible light, right? The radiation is at a wavelength that is typical of the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. But what the Earth radiates back out into space is mostly infrared light. For every one photon we get from the sun, the Earth radiates 20 photons back into the universe. The same amount of energy, because the average energy of the photons we're radiating away is 1 20th of the energy we get from the sun, but we've increased the entropy of that energy 20 times. So the resource that we're using from the sun isn't really energy itself. It's the fact that that energy is in a useful, compressed, low entropy form. When we do that photosynthesis, that eating, that conversion of sugar into ATP energy that flows through our body and lets us move, we are degrading the energy that ultimately comes from the sun, turning it into less useful forms, generating heat, and then radiating that back out into the universe. So can we learn anything by thinking about systems in this way, in this general picture? I think that there might be. You know, one thing is you might suspect that just because things create entropy, complex systems like you or me or the internet or a car need to generate entropy to keep going, maybe there's another rule that says we generate entropy as fast as possible. But that turns out not to be true. If that were true, everything would just explode, right, into some chaotic mess. Not only the sun giving off radiation, but the earth and people and puppies would all just explode in higher entropy configurations. That is not what actually happens. There is no rule that says that entropy wants to be generated as fast as possible. In fact, you can talk about the efficiency of different ways in which we use energy in the universe. Whenever there is heat 
being generated, that's a sign that entropy is being created. When the internal combustion engine on your car heats up, it's because it's turning the useful energy in its fuel into useless heat that is being radiated back out into the universe, increasing the entropy all the way. So we can start asking ourselves, is that kind of thing necessary? How efficient can we be at using our energy? One thing that uses energy is the simple act of computing. Computers generate heat. When computers do calculations, they create entropy, they heat up. You know this, whether you're running a server farm or just sitting with your laptop on your lap. And the total amount of energy we're using in calculations is enormously large in the modern world. Something like 5% of the total energy use in the United States goes to computations. We've all heard about Bitcoin mining in China where these giant server farms are heating up the atmosphere around them. So we might want to ask, can we do better? Is it possible? Or are our current computers already doing the best possible job, being the most efficient at generating the least entropy? The answer is our current technology is terribly inefficient. We know this because we have examples of efficient computations. You have them in your body. The cells in your body are doing computations. If you think about the RNA, DNA, protein processes going on in microbiology, you can think of those as calculations being done, and you can show they do generate a little bit of heat, they generate a little bit of entropy, but they don't generate that much, otherwise you'd be burning up. It turns out that the calculations being done inside your cells are orders of magnitude more efficient than those that are done in the most efficient computer that we build in silicon in our factories today. So this suggests that there is a new frontier out there in computation. We already know about the speed frontier. Moore's law has been pretty good for a while, but maybe it's tapering off. We know about the memory frontier, but we also have the efficiency frontier. As we need to do more and more heavy duty calculations, we're gonna have to be able to do them in more efficient ways. Physics can help with this, both by suggesting the problem and by suggesting different kinds of solutions to us. Because the physicist doesn't care about this particular computer architecture. The physicist cares about the general principles by which all complex systems work. So what I want to suggest is this is a good way, not the only way, but a very helpful way to think about the big problems facing us in society. Thinking about the general principles, the underlying themes that connect different disciplines, different problems, different ways of thinking, whether it's physical systems, astrophysical systems, biological systems, economics, politics, society, or technology. All of these are complex systems that obey general principles. Thinking deeply about what they are, connecting them to each other, that's a way we're gonna move forward.